There we go. Let's try it now. There's audio. Okay, we're good. Thought I caught this the first time. Well, it's October, so it's time to get our horror on. This year, my theme, much as it is, putting aside the um, Nintendo Power Retrospectives and Nightfall Saga, which I am absolutely not going to skip this time, actually relevant to October, um, we're be covering horror novels of the 1970s and 80s. Um, but again, since I've only got two weeks, rather than doing like direct novel reviews, um, instead, I have a book which I about the novels of this period, and then a film adaptation thereof. And we'll, we're leading off with that book, Paperbacks from Hell, nonfiction book that takes a deep dive into paperbacks of paperback horror fiction of this period. Now, before we kick off, I do need to do the business of reminding you to like this video and subscribe if you enjoy what you're seeing. And, of course, to ring the bell if you want to know whenever my next video, be it review or let's play or what have you, comes out. In the 1970s and 80s, there was a massive boom in horror cinema of various stripes, from the U.S. and Italy, Canada and elsewhere, all combined with the general boom in exploitation films. This boom was not just limited to film. This period also saw a dramatic increase in the amount of horror novels being published in the United States, with successful novels like The Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, The Amityville Horror, and Jaws leading to an accompanying rise in horror novels, particularly after all four of those got adapted into to the screen and those films were in turn incredibly successful. Paperbacks from Hell goes, goes into this boom and basically breaks down the slew of horror novels that, in this period into manageable chunks. Not by year, but rather by subgenre, getting into what gives each subgenre of horror its appeal. White from, right from the Cities um, and success of the Amityville Horror, for example, leading to boosting the popularity of haunted house stories. The tone of the work is somewhat irreverent, it, clearly recognizing that when you have so many hundreds upon hundreds of horror novels and myriad subgenres, this can lead to a very high level of crap and a lot of formulaic writing. It makes for a book that I'd almost describe as what you'd get if D. Amanda Hagen or Brandon Tennold, probably more Tennold than Hagen, um, wrote a guide to exploitation film. Now, the book pulls no punches when it comes to criticism. The author, Grady Hendricks, makes it clear that for in some of these genres in particular, especially those who put the horror in, for example, an urban setting, are written to play on more conservative fears. Hendricks does a good job of calling attention to a great deal of the misogyny that can come in these books, along to other bits of bigotry, like, for example, when it comes to writing women of uh, people of color and LGBT, pe LGBT people. In turn, on the other hand, the horror books that are set around more, uh, more rural settings, on the one hand, have more progressive-ish progressive observations, like one novel has a coal town making a deal with the devil to reopen the mine and bring the jobs back, but reopening a portal to hell in the process. But on the other hand, this can also lead to condescending perspectives of, rural po of the rural poor. So... There's issues that can come up there as well. Now, while some of the big names of this period, obviously Stephen King, um, Clive Barker and Rice, but also Peter Straub and Poppy Z. Bright are certainly mentioned as their work helped keep the boom going and perpetuate it um, for um, multiple decades. Indeed, their fic those authors' fiction has been able to endure long after the paperback boom, ha boom has ended, he also puts a lot of focus on a lot more lesser-known horror, horror authors. By no means are all these authors all good, but they are all certainly interesting, either in terms of the particular fears that they call on to fuel their work or their own personal careers. Now, the book is also interspersed with a wide array of the color, Im color images of the covers of these books, which on its own makes for very engrossing reading and viewing in the um, in the big uh, color uh, pages in the middle. 
as the books in these various genres tended to go more and more over the top to one-up both the last installment of their series and competing series as well, the covers similarly get more and more hilariously macabre, going from creepy to gross to just absurd. Between the descriptions of the books in here and also, like, honestly looking at the covers and wanting to see what's inside the, what, what story is inside it, you are, can very easily just find yourself doubling or tripling or quadrupling the size of your Goodreads list, um, just from this book, just from this one book. If nothing else, I found myself wishing there was a YouTube show, like Brandon Tenold's uh, channel or D. Amanda Hagen's channels, that approach this genre, this this chunk of of twenty ish years of horror fiction, with the same irreverent humor that those shows do to the seventies and exploitation horror movies. I've already got a bunch on my plate already, honestly. Like between Nintendo Power Retrospectives, Nightfall Saga, and eventually returning to uh, Legends of the Force, that kind of precludes me taking up the torch myself, but there is a place in internet horror fandom for someone to take this up instead. And indeed, if so, if you know of a channel that has taken up this torch, or pitchfork, as the case may be, please let me know in the comments. I would love to follow that channel. Next time, we get to one of the adaptations with a lesser-known title, not the big ones, not your Rosemary's Baby, your Adam and Eve horror. We're going to go in with The Sentinel. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.